Hello, everyone. Welcome to Be Gurus. Uh, I'm just covering the leftover questions from episodes 64 and 65. And obviously, if you like the content that we produce, please do uh, like, share, and subscribe. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. Bhartwaj S. Comparing the founding fathers of USA and India, did they have a better vision for their country compared to us? Uh, did our founding fathers have a vision? Okay, look. Uh, yeah, they did do a better job than us because the thing was they accepted uh, human frailty. They accepted the need for constant change. Okay. They accepted systemic checks and balances. Our founding fathers... Uh, Within years, two, three years, read Tripurdaman's 16, Tripurdaman Singh 16 stormy days. Within the first two, three years of the constitution, they had to pass the first amendment. Right. So clearly, uh, you know, in India, the framing of the document was done based on ideals, not on practicality. And it had to be changed much more often, uh, much quicker, uh, even within the lifetime of the founding fathers themselves. So yes, they were. Uh, they, they let's say they had a much better inkling of human frailty. Uh, the second part of the question: Are we we are a young economy compared to the US as we got uh, on independence only seventy five years? That doesn't matter. There are lots of younger economies than us that have done much better than us. Singapore got its independence after us. Uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, Japan. Uh, uh, where, when did the occupation of Germany end? When did the occupation of Japan end? So, no, I'm sorry. These are just excuses. Next. Malyaban. Hey, Aim, is South Indian biryani more spicy compared to their northeastern, northern and eastern counterparts? No, they're not. Uh, they're actually much more herbal. They're not spicy, they're herbal. Uh, because the main flavors there are uh, pudina and uh, uh, mint and coriander. Uh, whereas in the north, the uh, Dili biryani, the main spice is chili pickle, surprise, surprise. And in the east, it's actually really spicy because they put like 15, 20 different spices in their biryani. So, uh, no, it's not. Uh, next. Aim, sir, your opinion on Mesa's Bharat Forge and their defense products, they're actually very good. Uh, the uh, thing, of course, is that every good defense company in India ke keeps getting screwed over by the government. Okay, For example, Indian companies uh, can't test because the DRDO holds all the testing facilities close to them and they don't allow Indian companies to test. So where do Indian companies test? Uh, they keep putting higher and higher standards for domestic companies and they allow foreign companies to get away with murder. It is a fundamental corruption in the system. It has not been addressed. Uh, Simple example, uh, there was a company that was producing very good rifles in India, but no, they chose SIG from uh, 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 America for something, and they chose uh, the Russian AK-203. Uh, why? Because they wanted uh, this company to be doing things, which incidentally they did. And in spite of all that R&D, they just threw them because they wanted something for it. It was that simple. Uh, it's one of the most naked and blatant corruptions in the system, but is it going to be fixed? Of course not. Divyan Shushivastava, is it true that the Indian government has given US assurance on S-400 on US equipment? Who would be responsible for another 27 Feb-like incident if it happens in the future? Yes, it is possibly true. Uh, that's what it seems like. At least that's what the American side is telling me. Uh, well, look, there was no way you could integrate it. Uh, integration of these things with American equ equipment requires source codes. The Americans have never shared source codes with anyone in the past, except maybe the British and the Australians. Uh, right. So you were never up for source codes. You couldn't have integrated them even if they want to. Forget what the military is telling you. They claim they can integrate everything. They cannot. Even first world countries find these things horribly difficult to do. So for us to be able to do it was impossible. And, uh, well, they should have thought about that before buying. Because if you're not getting the source codes for something, how in the hell did you think you were able to integrate? This is what you get when you start multi-sourcing equipment like this. So, you know, there's nobody responsible for it more than your own military. Next. Analog kit. Will the population control bill be good for Hindus in the long run? 
why have hindus abandoned the idea of middle child with a slogan hum do hamare do uh, nobody says hum do hamare do anymore uh, and lock it uh, that used to be during indira gandhi's time i don't think anybody's had a population uh, control campaign uh, for a long time uh, look population control the problem with population control is this is not something you do artificially when you do it artificially uh, it uh, lands you up in a serious demographic uh, nightmares like china is in at the moment with a dependency ratio with a in inverted pyramid and a dependency ratio very bad two is to one dependency ratio that's not a good idea so what you have to do is see the answer to your population problems what happens first is you know in a pre industrial society you effectively have malthusian economics wherein the population is controlled the population becomes too big and then natural factors set in like deforestation uh, then the floods wash away because of deforestation the floods wash away the top soil eroding fertility etc 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 then you have famine and drought uh because you know more trees the more rain you get so then you have uh, drought and then because of the drought uh, you then have famine both droughts and floods lead to famine and uh you know your population most of them die out this is malthusian economics that happened in pre industrial societies once you come to industrial societies what happens is your medicine uh is improving it's becoming scientific medicine and so your infant mortality starts dropping uh you start moving to industrial jobs so you have more secure income uh and so what happens is but you're still stuck in a mindset of your agricultural past which is more children are more security for you so you keep producing children okay and education also tends to in this stage to be very standard uh very, very low level actually so you produce more and more and more children because that is your social security net but then when you industrialize the cost of bearing a of raising a child is too much it becomes an investment it becomes an expense infant mortality becomes almost nothing so you know you don't have to produce so many children so that they live your country has become so rich that the government can afford to give you a social security net so your children are no longer your social security net this is how you control population remember britain france germany america canada none of the developed developed countries ever required population control okay these are natural things that need to happen naturally so i'm not concerned about this question of hindus because remember you think it is going to control the muslim population but remember it is the up wala hindu who is offsetting who produces a lot of kids who's offsetting the up wala muslim who produces a lot of kids okay so even there but even then don't look at this as a hindu muslim thing you want to control both hindu and muslim population rates then you need to go in for industrial growth and not industrial growth if you start industrial growth now then 30 40 years down the line that is when your population stabilizes not this way theek hai that's this i everybody talks about nehru but nobody talks about a second prime minister uh, what's your views on the legacy of lal bahadur shastri and his mysterious death well there's a lot to say say about his mysterious death because i think even the russians now believe that it was foul play i think we can all agree that it was pretty much foul play uh uh well if not foul play then if the death wasn't foul play definitely the cover up and things like that were but uh uh with uh, regards to uh, the legacy of the second prime minister he was the first step in taking it away from family rule so he died too quickly that said uh he wasn't particularly less socialist than the previous one or the one that came after him so you know this belief that he would have somehow changed the path uh did you see any better economics under lal bahadur shastri no he was also prone to the sloganeering jai jawan jai kisan why i mean you should technically be saying jai jawan jai industry no so he did nothing to dismantle all the horrific socialism of nehru so it was uh, you know institutionalized socialism in that sense next yatish patak aim as a free speech absolutist are there any limit criteria in free speech i am not a free speech absolutist i am absolutely not i don't know who told you that anand and i have had this conversation he is a free speech absolutist i am not a free speech absolutist 
I'm a Brandenburg principalist, which is to say that any speech that involves a specific target, which either an individual or a group, and involves a specific threat. So, for example, Gustake Rasul ka saza sartan se juda sartan se juda. Gustake Rasul, you know who is in the current conversation is doing the Gustaki, and you have a specific threat, sartan se juda, beheading. That is not free speech. You go to jail. Okay. Now, uh, take for example Zubair and blasphemy. Is that free speech? Accusing Nupur Sharma of blasphemy. No, it is not free speech. Because you have enabled the slogans that have led to death threats against her because you know what the accusation of blasphemy does in Islam. Okay, so this is like going and shouting fire in a, uh, uh, a movie theater. You can't do that. You can go to an open field and shout fire, but there is a context to it. You can't go to a movie theater and shout fire, which will lead to a stampede. You know what it will lead to. It will lead to a stampede, and in all possibility, people will get killed. They may not, but still, you've caused mischief. You've created that danger of a stampede. So he knew exactly what he was doing. So I know I am not a free speech absolutist, boss. But generally, the Brandenburg principle and responsibility principle, those are the ones uh, you know that you know what the consequences are going to be. Th those are my hard limits. Uh, Jahangir Gotla will continuous chaos because of the lack of iron will by the central government eventually catch up with economic promises. Well, look, uh, it already is. You're seeing all the stock of FDI, but I'm not seeing any new factories come up. Have you seen a new factory come up? So where is all this FDI going? I don't know. Uh, is it mostly coming in from Mauritius, which is, you know, basically your Benami uh, uh, money coming in and your Havala money coming in through different means? Uh, I'm not seeing factories. So again, when you talk about FDI, nobody seems to be willing to match it. Where is the industrial startup data? Everybody talks about startup, startup, startup is not manufacturing. You're not providing jobs for the people who actually need the jobs. So I'm not buying this FDI nonsense till I see what the data on new industry, new manufacturing being set up in this country is. But yes, it will eventually catch up. Abhishek Desikan, on Sai Deepak's response, is it, uh, it's not just that it's Western, but the Abrahamic roots that influence policies today. Hence, need for decoloniality. Uh, look, boss, uh, first of all, you need to understand what decoloniality is. In his book, he says logic is colonial. Logic is a colonial construct. Literally, it's there in that book, in as many words. I'm not even paraphrasing, I'm quoting. So if you think logic is decoloniality, then you know, I mean, there's no help for you. So just because it's Western doesn't mean it's bad. Just because it's Abrahamic doesn't mean it's bad. You know, in this country, you did not have checks and balances on the government. The whole concept of checks and balances on a, a, a king comes from Western law. You look at Europe in the 1200s and 1300s, the kind of checks and balances developed. Uh, you should really read Barbara Tuchman's uh, The Calamitous uh, uh, 14th Century. Um, and there you'll see the kind of checks and balances that they had on increasing taxation and things like that. We never had in India. You had to have elected representatives from every village approve every tax uh, increase and things like that. Okay, so uh, uh, the, so, so then get away with it. I mean, I mean uh, get rid of it. Uh, we didn't, uh, you know, have uh, uh, the uh, uh, the idea of ratification by parliament. Get rid of it. That. So I'm sorry, but this whole nonsense, this decoloniality in Abrahamic is taking it to the point of the absurd, to the point of utter nonsense. If you don't want it, if you want to become a dictatorship and be ruled by a god king who knows and is Ashta Pradhan, eight uh, old fogies who control everything and who are the only check and balance uh, that you need, go ahead and do it. I don't know what purpose it serves, but that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard in my life. Next. 
Karthik AMP, what's your take on the current crisis in TN with regards to a diff between EPS and OPS? Is BJP playing a role here? No, boss, this is your classic resource competition. Uh, both people trying to control. We knew it was never going to work, but as long as the uh, they were in power, it was fine. Once they're out of power, it's not going to be fine anymore. Uh, is BJP playing a role out here? I'm not seeing the BJP play a role out here. So that's that. Uh, other than that, it's nothing much. Uh, Govind108, what do you see as the economic future of Germany specifically and the EU in general? Uh, I don't see uh, much of an economic future for Germany right now. Uh, as long as energy and trade prices are high, you've already seen their trade balance for the first time in 30 years reverse. Uh, there are going to be further problems with Germany. They're going so far down the quality, quality, quality chain that they're moving very dangerously into the realm of unreliability and over-engineering. This is becoming a serious problem with all German products at the moment. Let me give you a simple example. I'm looking for things for my kitchen. I mean, forget cars and things. These are all things you can afford. Okay. Uh, a simple oven uh, um, with steam function, uh, with an additional microwave, okay, uh, on top, the built-in ovens I'm talking about, you can go and buy a Chinese model, which is very good, uh, or even a Korean model, uh, which is very good, which will last you for 15, 20 years, no complaint, for about 85, 90,000 together. Oven plus uh, 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 oven, including steam function, uh, fan function, plus a separate microwave, built-in microwave on top. I was looking at a Siemens and a Miele. Uh, the Siemens comes with all uh, five functions built into it, micro, steam, fan, convection, uh, grill. Uh, it was 4.6 lakhs. The Miele was 9 lakhs. The wider Miele was 11 lakhs. Okay, and there's so much technology in it that when I went to somebody and I refused to buy it because I was like, Iska, uh, I suspected because of the cars that I've owned, which have given me nothing but trouble, uh, 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 you know, that this might not be what it seems. So I went to two, three people who I know have mealers and talked to them and they're like, Abhijit, please don't buy it. Every six to seven months, something goes wrong with it. And of course, this was the exact problem I had with my car. And this is happening over and over and over again. So the German products are getting more and more unreliable. And it's not just in India. You look in the West. If you look at actuaries and insurance, the pride of all German engineering is uh, uh, the cars are in the top 10 most reliable, German and British engineering, because they're putting too much technology in there. Boeing doesn't have a problem with the 787. Well, they did. They sorted it out. You look at the paint issues on Airbus, they're even refusing to acknowledge that they have a problem. Then, of course, there's energy prices. They're going too dogmatic. They're getting rid of nuclear power when just because they have to get rid of nuclear power without thinking of the cost and the consequences. So they're getting dogmatic. They're over-engineering. Prices are going up. They're not thinking things through. They're caught up. See, Germans... Just because no nationalism sounds much better than national socialism doesn't mean it's necessarily a good thing. Dogma is always bad and they can't get away from dogma. They, As a nation, they brainwash themselves into believing certain things and they can't get rid of the brainwashing. That's how German society is. Uh, and it kind of applies to a lot of the EU as well. Next. Avijit Mohanty, with the Chinese being more active in the region since the last year, as Myanmar, no, Myanmar is the one country which will never pose a security threat to India, because as we've discussed in previous episodes of this uh, program, uh, uh, Myanmar is in fact one of the very few countries that man that has managed to screw over China on several different occasions and maintain its independence. Next. Okay, will Ilhan Omar come back as Congresswoman? Yes, her constituency is particularly woke. So, uh, yeah, she will. Uh, what's the status of the Islamophobia bill? I have no idea. Why can't you Google? Uh, is it likely to pass? Uh, well, if it happens before, uh, even before the midterm elections, I doubt it's going to pass. But after the midterm elections, it is definitely not going to pass because that's going to be a walkover for the Republicans. 
any lobbying by India against her actions? No, India does not lobby. See, mm -hmm. uh, our foreign service is too small and too full of itself to be doing any of this thing, so they don't. Uh, and does it impact India-US relations? Yes, ultimately it will, of course, uh, just like US Council for Religious Freedoms uh, does impact India-US relations. It will in the long term. Yeah. Next. Gaurav Kataria, uh, have you seen the Bill C-11 in Canada? Any thoughts? It's a bill to censor content on the web. No, I have not seen it. How are the new rules on big tech? Can India learn anything? Well, the first thing India can learn from EU rules on big tech is that we don't have the capacity to sift through uh, algorithms and understand what the algorithm is actually doing. So two of the things you actually need is algorithm transparency. And the second thing you need is absolute control over data storage, well, data localization, how it's used and what is censored within India. Uh, this is something the EU is moving towards both. India is moving towards neither. Why? Because the government is apparently compromised to big data. They get meetings with the PMO anytime they want. There's nothing you can do about it. So that's that. So Garo, has either of you seen Bill C-11 in Canada? I think these are all reflections of what has happened in the Europe. I think it's called GDPR, uh, data protection, and, and websites and other uh, entities need to put some, make sure that the data that they are putting is uh, verified or validated content. However, if this content itself, now people are deliberately playing with words. Sometimes the not in a particular sentence is removed, which means that the meaning goes the opposite of what it was intended for. So this is a, a changing or moving target. These are just like trying to catch some low hanging fruit. But if someone intentionally lies, you know, you have to call out the lie. If take, for example, the USCIRF. They know that what they have put out as a report on India is patently false, but it doesn't stop them from touting that. And then based on that, the Congress wants to say something. Blinken had issued a statement and a whole bunch of new festivals of you know bashing india will start unfortunately you know no matter how loudly one opposes saying that there are the facts are all wrong they have 58 references are you going to tell me that every one of them is wrong most likely they are the reason i say this 58 is you know they, if they had put 10 and 10 or even 20 and uh, 38 then I can say, okay, fine, at least they have tried to include the opposing point of view, but they did none of that. They're just hoping that when you hide the references by, you know, how you have a text with blue color, where you don't know where the reference is from until it is too late. So they're, they're trying to build their case, but it is patently false. Unfortunately, the very people who want to regulate this, they themselves are guilty of the crime. That's all I can say. So can India learn anything from this? I think India needs to have its own version. I believe they already do. Now, here is what little I know that all the companies such as Twitter, Facebook and so on and, and WhatsApp, they were asked, can you tell us who originated a fake narrative? They all said it can be done, but it has not been done. And it is my contention that it is very difficult to put that thing now into an existing product. Rather, it should be done in a new product. That is my two cents on it. I've seen the implementation. You have to include that with every tweet. And if you do it only partially, then people will say, wait a minute, this is not you know, working. It is difficult to explain to a common man how you can track the source of a fake narrative. However, if it's a new software that is just getting launched, such as like Ku did three, four years ago, it definitely is possible. It takes some work. But it is possible. Next, Ritu Patil, your prediction on the Twitter Musk lawsuit? Who I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, I doubt very much that uh, 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 they'll be forced. Uh, the court will force Musk to go through with it uh, because it is based on certain things, especially the algorithms regarding bots and shit like that. And clearly, they had a very rudimentary process, which they are not able to satisfy uh, uh, the need to figure out uh, what the total number of bots is. I suspect Musk will uh, uh, ultimately win. But I also suspect that this is a gambit. 
Uh, what he's going to do is to lower the price. He offered, what, 44 billion? He'll re reduce it to like 30, 33 billion and buy it for a uh, discount. At any rate, what this lawsuit has done is it's completely ruined Twitter's uh, value in the market. Because no matter who the next buyer is, uh, they will not be able to get a price like this ever again because of uh, the bots. Uh, so either way, he is going to destroy Twitter, uh, win or lose. If he wins, of course, he'll destroy. Even if he loses, in that sense, Twitter's credibility is finished because then it comes to the valuation and that becomes a problem. Next. Kapil Gund, does Modi's speech about self-reliance and defense make you hopeful? I don't depend on speeches, Kapil. I go by actions. I have seen very little by way of actions. I've seen a lot by way of hot air. This is not the first speech. Uh, I've been listening to the same speech in different permutations and combinations for the last 20, 25 years, as long as I've been following defense. So, uh, no. Uh, he seems to, in fact, quite the opposite. He seems to be uh, caught up in the same delusions, lack of primary data, and overestimation of one's capabilities. Next. Shivam Goyal, why Central Asia, Central and South Africa that's not civilized versus North Africa. Ooh, interesting question. I guess mostly because of the Sahara. It's such an impenetrable barrier. You go uh, do a satellite uh, thing of uh, Google Maps of uh, uh, Africa, you'll see the North was integrated into all. Technically, North Africa is the Middle East. You look at it historically, they've either been integrated into the Mediterranean trading zone or into the Middle East trading zone. Egypt was constantly receiving goods from Harappa, from Mesopotamia, from the Hittites, from Greece, from everything. North Africa was constantly in touch with uh, Europe and the Middle East and things. And so it became a very easy way of transmitting information and things. This is what, uh, you know, this... Uh, 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 Jared Diamond talks about that an east-west orientation, because climactic patterns are similar, are much more likely to transmit ideas and trade and goods than a northwest orientation, which is why, even though the Maya developed writing, it neither traveled north to the Aztecs nor did it travel south to the Incas. Why? Because of the north-south orientation. Africa is a north-south oriented continent. So across the east-west, all the way from, uh, you know, uh, Carthage and uh, 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 Morocco to Egypt, you had an almost equivalent level of civilization. You look at the ancient ruins in uh, 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 Carthage and things, they're stunning. Right? They were way ahead of Rome once upon a time. But with Africa, what happens is you have that impenetrable barrier of the Sahara, almost impenetrable definitely doesn't make trade easy. The Nile is very difficult to navigate in those areas. So, you know, you have a complete climactic shift and then you have absolutely dense forests. And in those dense forests, unless you have a transmission of ideas and things, how are you going to develop? So there's a reason for it. Next. Uh, between China, Iran, Turkey, Israel, India combined programs, who is the most ahead in drone, both armed and surveillance? By far, Israel. Israel is the pioneer in the field. America has taken over, but Israel's lead, because Israel had a very focused program. They did not want tanks fighting tanks. They realized that this tank on tank was uh, a waste of time. Tanks should be doing other things. They should be fighting other tanks. So they came up with drones in order to be able to unmanned, remotely destroy tanks from the air, right? Uh, Turkey caught on much later. China still has issues with the accuracy and uh, 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 the comms and things like that. It's a susceptibility to jamming and things like that. Iran, I don't even take seriously. Uh, in terms of drone technology. They keep coming up with these fighters and drones and things like that. All they are is technically remote-controlled aircraft. A drone is extremely sophisticated technology. They do not uh, exactly have a lot of that tech that has to go with it. So I, if you wanted me to uh, uh, layer it, I would say Israel first, uh, then China, 
uh, then Turkey, then India, and India is way lower. I'm talking about Israel here, China here, Turkey here, Iran. You can't even see where Iran is. Could you remove the uh, question for a second? Iran, uh, India here, and Iran here. That's how the hierarchy goes. Next. Duke Bloke, I'm not sure if you got a chance to see rocketry, but the fact that Nambi brought cryogenic engines and parts and landed in Karachi for refueling. Uh, no, I haven't seen it yet, so I'm not going to comment right now. But uh, remember, all movies tend to sensationalize a bit, which is fine. You need movies to sensationalize a bit. But uh, no, I haven't seen it. When I see it, I'll tell you. Next. Uh, also, refueling in Karachi is not a big deal. In those days, you had to refuel in different parts. And, you know, uh, a plane is treated as a sovereign territory of a country, in effect. So it's not a particularly ballsy move. It's it's almost a routine move. Uh, it happens very, very often. Uh, what happened to the black money in Switzerland? Why are we not able to get it? Good question. Why are we not able to get it? Somebody promised they were going to get it back. But after coming to power, they did nothing about it. Why do you think that is? Do you think that the brains, do you think they have the financial brains to go after it? Of course not. What was it? Empty promises? Of course, yes. And what happened to the, uh, uh, what happened to all that money? Because Switzerland unilaterally became transparent. Well, it all got shifted to the Cayman Islands. And Cayman Islands, it's lock, stock, barrel proof. They don't care about any sanctions and things like that. They're quite happy with sanctions, in fact, American financial sanctions. There is no travel or uh, uh, you know tourism sanctions on the Cayman Islands. And they're fine with that because their entire economy runs on this black money. And the Brits aren't willing to give it up for anything. So that's where it all went, the Cayman Islands. Next. Steel plant Babai. How to clean the Indian judiciary of leftist thugs? Well, look, they can be leftist, but the point is it's accountability that cleans the judiciary. Okay, so first of all, you need at least four to five times the number of judges that you have right now. Several times, I mean, more than four or five times. I, I would say almost a, uh, 50, 60 times the number of judges, number one. Uh, and number two, uh, that uh, every incoming parliament passes a sense of legislature, which is to say you canonize that bail is the uh, uh, norm Jail is the exception. And then you judge, you have a clear marking criteria where every judge sees where uh, they have violated the parliamentary directives on how they choose to interpret the law and uh, have it on a point system. Next, get rid of the collegium. The collegium is a completely legal body. It, uh, it is tantamount to an ongoing coup against the Indian constitution and the Indian Republic. I think it's a treasonous body. Uh, you get rid of the collegium and it, I mean, who created the collegium? Getting rid of the collegium is the easiest thing on earth. You just say you will treat any meeting of the collegium or existence of the collegium will be treated as an act of treason. It's really that simple. Uh, because nowhere in the constitution does it say, or any constitutional amendment or any bill does it say collegium, right? You get rid of it. Uh, and finally, make the entire process completely transparent on who gets elevated for what based on the point system. And if you keep violating the points, uh, uh, the, the sense of parliament, the sense of legislature, you won't get promoted to being a judge. It's that simple. Vivek TR, I'm sure you love jackfruit. Yes, I do love jackfruit, both raw and uh, ripe. How can India process this wonderful fruit of India without wasting it? How do you use the fruit, not just in its raw form? Well, I use it, like I said, I make uh, a sabzi with its seed when it's raw. I make lots of sabzi with the raw jackfruit and it's uh, 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 lots of sabzi and biryanis, especially with the uh, raw jackfruit. And the ripe jackfruit, I just eat as is because it. I think jackfruit is probably my favorite fruit. If I see it, I'll polish off like half a jackfruit in one sitting. So what ends up happening is, how can India process this? Well, you need a marketing campaign. We never have marketing campaigns. Uh, 
do go to YouTube and search on the Thai restaurant model. Do you know every Thai restaurant anywhere in the world gets its patented recipes and things like that from the Thai government? It has been a systematic multi-year effort. It is the biggest single spy organization, if you want to call it that, uh, in the world. Nobody realizes it, but it was a concerted effort by the Thai government to make Thai food popular. Now, in India, you need to start taking culture seriously. You need to start having geographical denominations uh, for things, preserving your bio, uh, your uh, agricultural diversity and things like that. It's being done privately, but it's not being done by the government, so there's nothing much you can do. And this is where you have popularization campaigns. Do you, do you remember seeing all those olive oil popularization campaigns on TV? To the point where people, Sanjeev Kapoor of all people, went around saying, oh, this achar is very good and it's healthy for you because it's made in olive oil. Are you kidding me? Your mustard oil is just as good as your bloody olive oil, man. So you need to get into serious marketing. Next. Suyash P. Good sources, lots of books, boss. I've told you before, don't ask me for one book, two book, and things like this. A good source about world history is like asking me what's a good source of science. How am I meant to answer that? You need to read at least like a hundred books a year, minimum. And out of that, you'll read lots of bad books. But remember, the bad books are also important. Because how do you know what is good and what is bad without reading a bad book? Next. Arjuna, any opinion on the Kaleshwaram project? No. I don't even know what it is. Next. What happened to the Hyderabad rape case? Um, I don't know. You can Google it, I'm sure. Next. Siddharth Shekhar, is MSP for farmers a big drain on the economy? Yes, it is. It's it's a huge amount of money simply going waste into procuring rotting third-rate crops, which nobody has any use for. And obviously, that was the whole point of MSP, that it's not meant to be matched to supply-demand. Next. I'm planning to visit Iran. Any advice? Yes, please go on a group tour. Don't just go around alone. You can go around alone after you've been there the first time by yourself and gauge to what uh, 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 to do and how to get around and things like that. But go in a group first time and uh, just enjoy yourself. Uh, my honest suggestion to you, Harsh, depending on your diet, uh, dietary plans is if you need chili, take some seriously hot bhut jalokia sauce or Tabasco or something like that with you. Because trust me, you're really going to need it in Iran. Also, if you're vegetarian, please take a lot of MTR boiled meals. Because other than Salad Shirazi, which is basically your kachumbar, you're not really going to get vegetarian food. Even in their vegetables, they'll cook it with a little bit of meat, fat or meat and things like that. Yeah, next. Naman Kandpal. I'm in IT infra, pre-sales technical. Which countries? Uh, I'm sorry, Naman, but I really don't know much about IT and where pre-sales technical fits into the ladder. Uh, this should be a question for Sri, please. She is the best person to answer this. Naman Kantpal wants to know, I am in IT infra pre-sales. Which countries do you think would be great for move to apart from the US where they offer good salaries toss between Canada, Australia and UK slash Ireland? If I have to choose, I would choose Canada just for the simple reason that the path to green card is much faster. And also remember, if you have a green card in Canada, it is easier to find work in the United States living in Canada. The two have a NAFTA treaty and there are many jobs that you can do living in Canada and work with a U.S. company. If you go to, if you come to U.S., you're looking at 15 to 18 years before you get your green card. And before that, you have to do some more tapasya. So I hope you get the idea. Sharvin Shelke, what are world military? Why are world militaries not focused on VTOL aircraft? Well, because VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing, imposes severe, severe limits on aircraft performance. Okay, you've seen the VTOL version of the F-35 is the most limited in what it can do. Similarly, the Harrier was extremely limited in what it can do. So it is a trade-off that nobody is willing to make. 
And in fact, nobody will make that trade off till you get to a stage where you can come up with anti gravity, some kind of anti gravity device, because that is when uh, vertical takeoff and landing that, uh, 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 you know, the uh, balancing between performance and vertical uh, abilities uh, gets eroded to the point of nothingness. That is when it really takes off. But till then, it is always veto is always going to be problematic and most countries will decide that it is simply not worth their time effort or money uh, and if a hypersonic missile blows up sorry blows up the runway your air force is grounded well if any missile blows up your runway you're pretty much grounded why hypersonic uh, you don't even need hypersonic missiles to bomb runways uh, you you could their purpose built bombs for it the matra durangal i think is what we use in India, but uh, yeah, you don't need sonic missiles, but yeah, you are grounded. But it depends on where you bomb it. Huh? Uh, what the Saudis were doing in Yemen was they were bombing the ends of the runway, uh, which did nothing. Uh, when the Israelis bomb, they'll bomb right at the center of the runway, or they'll bomb at three quarters of the runway, so that uh, you know uh, <coughs> fighters, uh, <coughs> uh, the the long range aircraft can't take off. Uh, depending on what they want to do or if they want fighters to not take off they'll bomb it uh, at uh, three fourths and three fourths of the runway so you can't take off on either side and they'll also bomb the taxiways because remember all fighters can take off on taxiways if it is long enough okay uh, so yeah next puneet singh when russia and ukraine war will end Ooh, let me see <laughs> not anytime soon two, three years, four years, maybe. Yeah. Minimum two years, boss. Maybe even over that.